The question is, the figure shows velocity time graph of a particle moving along a straight line. Identify the correct statement. All right, what are the statements? The particle crosses its initial position at t is equal to 3 seconds. The particle crosses its initial position at t is equal to 2 seconds. The average speed of the particle in the time interval 0 to 2 seconds is 0. And the initial speed of particle is 0. So what do we need to figure out? When does the particle cross its initial position? The average speed in the first 2 seconds and the initial speed of the particle. If we do that, we will be able to solve this question. Okay. So we have the velocity time graph. Now, when it says, when does it cross its initial position and it is moving in a straight line, what it means is that let's say it started here, then it might be going in one direction. But it, if, if it has to cross the initial position, then it has to return and come back to its initial position, which means that the particle has reversed the direction. Does that show up in the graph? Let's see. So we know that the direction of velocity gives me the direction of motion of the particle. So here, the velocity is positive. It is above the t-axis. If the velocity is positive, then it is moving in the positive direction. But when we look after one second, and in the interim at t is equal to one second, the velocity becomes zero, which means that the particle stopped momentarily. And now the velocity here has become negative, which means now it is moving in the opposite direction. Is that correct? So naturally, the, at some instant, it is going to cross its initial position. Okay. Now, when is it going to cross its initial position? When this displacement going forward and this displacement going backward becomes equal, right? Which means that the particle has reached its initial position. Okay. Now, how do we find displacement in a velocity time graph? The displacement is the integral of v dt, which means the area under the velocity time curve. Okay, so what we see here is that the area here is positive. Okay, from 0 to 1 second, the area is positive, and in 1 to 2 second, the area is negative because it is below the t axis, which essentially means that the displacement is now in the opposite direction. Perfect. Now, what we look at when we look at the areas, okay, we see that this area, if I call it a1, and this area, if I call it a2. Is going to be equal in magnitude that is pretty obvious from the diagram so which means from a to b it made some positive displacement but from b to d it has made the displacement equal to the positive displacement but in the opposite direction which means it is going to reach its original position okay what does it mean that at t is equal to two second the displacement is going to be zero is that correct so one of the options we have already figured out. Okay, let's look at the other thing. The other thing we need to look at is what is the speed of the particle? Now, the speed of the particle is given by the distance traveled divided by time. Now, distance is a scalar quantity and it does not depend on direction. Okay, so let's call this area A1 and let's call this area A2. So, from A to B, the displacement is in the positive direction. But from B to D, the displacement is in the negative direction. But for calculating distance, I really don't care. I'm going to take the magnitude of area A1 and magnitude of area A2. And this is going to be my distance. Correct? Is it zero? Not at all. So will the velocity or sorry, will the speed of the particle be zero in the first two seconds? Not at all. Right? So this is not going to be equal to zero. So the other option also we have figured out. Okay. And now the last thing is, what is the speed of the particle at the initial time? Okay. So if we talk about the initial time, this is the initial time, t is equal to zero. What is the velocity of the particle? The velocity of the particle is 10 meter per second. Okay. So the magnitude of instantaneous velocity gives me the instantaneous speed. So what is the speed of the particle? The speed of the particle is 10 meter per second at t is equal to zero, which gives me the answer to the third option. All right. So now let's have a look at the options. So option B, the particle crosses its initial position at t is equal to 2 seconds will be the right answer. Option C, no, the distance covered is not 0, hence the speed is not 0, average speed is not 0, and the initial speed is also not 0. All right. So option B is going to be the right answer, and we move forward. A train A runs from east to west and another train B of the same mass and speed with respect to the earth 
runs from west to east along the equator. A presses the track with a force F1 and B with F2. Then what we need is the relationship between F1 and F2. All right. So let's understand the diagram first. Let's say this is Earth and this is the north-south axis. The train is running along the equator. So what I'm showing you here is the top view from the North Pole. So this equator is being represented by this circle and along this equator, the train is running. All right. Also, the Earth rotates from west to east. So if you look from the North Pole, you will see that the angular velocity is anti-clockwise. Perfect. Now, let's assume that this train is running and it has a speed V with respect to an inertial frame. Why an inertial frame? Because Earth is rotating, it has an angular velocity, hence it will have a centripetal acceleration. So This is no longer an inertial frame of reference. So let's say that I choose an inertial frame of reference I, which is out of Earth, probably in space. Okay. Now, with respect to this inertial frame, the speed is V. Okay. What are the other forces? The other forces is Mg which is the force towards the center of the earth and also there will be normal force which is the force exerted by the track on the train or by the train on the track. All right. So we need to figure out this relationship for normal force. Perfect. Now it is in circular motion. So what we can say very well is that mg minus n which is the net force towards the center is equal to mv square upon r where r is the radius of the earth. Now, n is going to become mg minus mv square upon r. What we see here is that if v is large, mg minus mv square by r is going to be small. And if v is small, n is going to be large. Okay. So basically, if v is small, then the force exerted by the track on the train or the train on the track is going to be larger. So we need to figure out what is the relationship between the speeds of the two scenarios. All right. So what is happening in scenario one? The train is running from east to west, which is in this direction. So let's say this is the velocity of the train with respect to the earth. Okay. At this point, what will be the velocity of the earth with respect to the inertial frame? So velocity of the earth with respect to the inertial frame is going to be in this direction because omega is anti-clockwise. Is that correct? Okay. So, if we not want to find out the velocity of the train with respect to the inertial frame, can we say that the velocity of train with respect to inertial frame is equal to velocity of train with respect to earth plus velocity of earth with respect to the inertial frame? Is that correct? That is a simple relative velocity relationship. Okay. Now, velocity of train is in one direction. Velocity of earth with respect to inertial frame is in the opposite direction. So this is going to become VTE minus VEI. So I'm just writing the magnitude. Is that correct? Okay, let's keep that in mind for case one. Now what will happen in case two? In case two, this is the direction of velocity of train with respect to the earth. Okay, and this is also the direction of velocity of the earth with respect to the inertial frame. So velocity of train with respect to inertial frame is equal to velocity of train with respect to the earth plus velocity of earth with respect to the inertial frame. Okay. Now both of them are in the same direction. So this becomes VTE plus VEI. So very easily you can understand that V1 that is the speed in the first scenario is lesser than the speed in the second scenario, which means that the force in the first scenario is going to be greater than the force in the second scenario. That is it. And that should be my answer. And let's have a look at the options. So option C is going to be the right option. The question is, a force F is equal to minus K by I plus XJ, where K is a positive constant, acts on a particle moving in the XY plane. Starting from the origin, the particle is taken along the positive X axis, to the point a comma zero and then parallel to the y axis to point a comma a then total work done by the force is all right what we see here is that the force is not a constant it is variable so when force is variable 
then we have to use work done is equal to integral of f dot dr. Only when the force is constant both in magnitude and direction, we can use work done is equal to f dot s. So here we have to use integral of f dot dr. All right. The next key concept here is that the work is path dependent. Okay, so if the particle is going from O to A to B, we have to integrate by going from O to A to B. We cannot directly go from O to B and calculate the work done. We will get a wrong answer. All right. So the work done is part dependent. So we will have to split this problem into two parts. One is going from O to A and the other will be from A to B. All right. So first let's talk about O A. When we are going from O to A, what is the force? Okay. So if we talk about the X and Y coordinates here, we are moving along the X direction, which means that the Y coordinate here is going to be zero throughout. So if I have to find the force, then I will have minus K and Y will become zero. And this will simply become X times J. Is that correct? That is the force acting when we are going from O to A. Now let's talk about the displacement. The displacement is only happening in the X direction. So can we say displacement is, go is going to be dx i cap. There will be no j cap component over here. All right, perfect. So if we calculate the small amount of work done, so this is going to be f dot dr. What we notice here is that the force is along the y axis. The displacement is along the x axis. They are making a 90 degree angle between them. So the work done has to be, yes, the work done has to be zero. All right, so when we are going from O to A, the work done is zero. Now let's talk about when we are going from A to B. So when we are going from A to B, what we notice here is that the X coordinate is constant over here because we are only moving in the Y direction, correct? So if I have to calculate the force, the force would be minus K YI plus what is the X coordinate here? It is A and then we have J cap, correct? Now what about DR? We are moving only in the Y direction. So will there be any displacement in the x direction? Not at all. So can we say this is going to be dy j cap, correct? Now, if we have to calculate the small amount of work done, we find out what is f dot tr. And what we notice that this is i cap and there is no corresponding i cap. So only this multiplied by this and this is going to give me the dot product, okay? So the dot product is going to become minus k a dy okay so that is dw so if we have to calculate the total work done we have to integrate minus k a dy and what are the limits of y we are going from here which is y is equal to 0 to here which is y is equal to a okay so y is going from 0 to a so this is going to become minus k a and then the integral of dy so integral of dy is going to be y and we have to put the limits from 0 to a and we when we do that after putting limits, we'll get it as y, which means that the final answer is going to be minus k a square. That will be the work done. All right. Now let's have a look at the options. So option C minus k a square is going to be the right option. A wire of length 1 meter is stretched by a force of 10 Newton. The area of cross section of the wire is 2 into 10 to the power minus 6 meters square and Young's modulus is 2 into 10 to the power 11 Newton per meter square. Increase in length of the wire will be, all right, so there is a wire, there is a load suspended. So obviously there is going to be an increase in length and we need to find out what that increase in length is going to be. So simple relationship we know about Young's modulus is that it is stress upon strain. What is stress? Stress is force divided by area and what is strain? Strain is delta L divided by L, okay? So from here, we can see very easily that delta L is going to be FL upon AY, right? So all we need to do is substitute and find the answer, okay? So what is F? F is 10 Newton. What is L? L is 1 meter divided by area of cross section is 2 into 10 to the power minus 6 meter square and the Young's modulus is 2 into 10 to the power 11, all right? So 110 and 110 from here gone. What are we left with? We are left with 1 upon 4 and then we have 10 to the power 4. So this 10 to the power 4 will go upstairs and become 10 to the power minus 4. So we have 0 0.25 into 10 to the power minus 4 
So if we write it properly, this is going to become 2.5 into 10 to the power minus 5 meter. And that is going to be my answer. Now let's have a look at the uh, options. So option C, 2.5 into 10 to the power minus 5 meter is going to be my answer. The question is, the compressibility of water is 5 into 10 to the power minus 10 meter square per newton. If it is subjected to a pressure of 15 megapascal, the fractional decrease in volume will be. Alright, so what is compressibility? So compressibility we know is the reciprocal of bulk modulus. So we can say that the bulk modulus is 1 upon 5 into 10 to the power minus 10 newton per meter square. Right. Now, what is the relationship between bulk modulus and the volume stress and strain? So, bulk modulus is equal to pressure divided by minus delta V by V. So, from here, we are going to get minus delta V by V and this will be P upon P. Now, what is minus delta V by V? It is the fractional de decrease in volume. So, this is going to become P, which is 15 mega Pascal. So, I'm going to write 15 into 10 to the power 6 Pascal divided by what is the bulk modulus? It is 1 upon 5 into 10 to the power minus 10. All right. So if I divide it, so we will have in the numerator 5 into 10 to the power minus 10. All right. So if we solve this, we're going to get 75 into 10 to the power minus 4. And if we write this properly, this is going to become 7.5 into 10 to the power minus 3. That will be the fractional decrease in the volume of the object. All right, let's have a look at the options. So option C is going to be the right answer.